Hi, it's Scott Averick from the Medical Evidence Blog. Uh, I wanted to do my first video podcast on an issue that came up at your Grand Rounds at the University of Utah the other day. It's a topic that I care a good deal about because uh, I think that non-inferiority trials, which is what this uh, talk will discuss, are a tool that is leveraged by uh, pharmaceutical industries to get their um, new products uh, FDA approved. I think they take advantage of it, and I think the entire design even as proposed by the consort authors, is biased. Uh, when they published this uh, consort revision of uh, guidelines for the reporting of non-inferiority trials in December of 2012, I followed up with a letter to the editor, which was published, uh, where that uh, I uh, advocate the changing of uh, this standard for non-inferiority because it's somewhat uh, arbitrary and it's biased strongly in a way to favor non-inferiority or superiority of a new treatment. And I'd like to explain that to you right now. The, the entire uh, crux of understanding non-inferiority can be summed up quite nicely. It's a beautiful figure that they've done. They've done very nice work. I just disagree with uh, some of the conclusions that they've arrived at. This is figure one uh, of the article, and it shows a, a typical kind of chart for either relative uh, risk reductions or hazard ratios or absolute risk difference. You could have any metric on there as long as uh, any, any metric that you wanted, but usually it's a, a hazard ratio or, or a relative uh, risk difference. So for, for example, if it was uh, mortality or clotting and the new treatment is better, then the risk of clotting would be 0.85 or a 15% reduction in, in this direction. So then down here you'd have you know 0.70 for example. Uh, and that in that direction, when the point estimate and the 95% confidence intervals fall to the uh, what from your perspective is the left side of, of the diagram, that favors the new uh, the new treatment new right as though there's something about it's being new. That, that gives it a, a, a special consideration, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. When the confidence intervals and the point estimates fall on this side, 1.15, 1.30, that's where that there is an increase in the, in, the, in the outcome, an undesirable increase, such the new treatment is worse. And somewhere along there, you have to sign a delta, or a value where that you think that difference is smaller than this, either on the basis of some kind of logical argument or prior precedence, or differences between placebo and active comparators that were historically observed, assuming that those are reliable, you can say that as long as the difference isn't greater than this delta value, we can consider uh, the, the treatment to be non-inferior. If the 95% confidence interval uh, in any way includes that, that value or falls to the right of it, we're going to have some difficult uh, conclusions. Uh, or if the point estimate in the entire 95% confidence interval falls all the way to this side, then they would say it's inferior. But let me walk you, let me walk you through this, for example. Supposing you're testing uh, dabigatran versus Coumadin for some kind of clotting disorder, atrial fibrillation, and you, you find that your point estimate falls to the, on the, favor, the, the side favoring dabigatran or the new treatment. And your 95% confidence interval does not include a hazard ratio of one or an absolute risk difference of zero. You can you are, have st a statistically significant difference then, and the consort authors say that we can declare superiority on the basis of that. For now, let's say that's fine. They then also say that if your point estimate's in the same spot, but your confidence interval's wider, so there's not a statistically significant difference that crosses a hazard ratio of one, then you can call uh, your treatment non-inferior. I also don't have uh, much of a complaint about that conclusion. Even if your point estimate favors the old treatment, the new treatment is worse, here's the point estimate on this side of the, of the hazard ratio of one, but your 95% confidence interval does not include delta, you can say it's not inferior. Now this gets very interesting, it gets absolutely spectacularly interesting here, that, that they would even suggest that we may come to this conclusion. They, they con according to the, the authors of the consort statement for the reporting of non-inferiority trials, if my point estimate and my 95% if my point estimate favors the old treatment, the new treatment is worse, and the entire 95% confidence interval actually is excludes the hazard ratio of one. So in other words, the, statistically, the new treatment is worse. 
But because it doesn't include, the 95% confidence interval doesn't include delta or extend past delta, then, and we've already said that this is a range where that we're indifferent, then we can say that the treatment is not inferior even though there's a statistically significant difference favoring the old therapy. So that to me sounds like a very paradoxical or illogical kind of claim to make. But we'll move on and I'll come back to it in a moment. They say that any time that your 95% confidence interval extends past delta, it's inconclusive because the 95% confidence interval includes the possibility that these that the true difference includes these values here, which are greater than the free specified margin of non-inferiority or delta here. Okay. So, and in the in the case of this one, for example, which I will erase to simplify things, it just means that your sample was way too small and you didn't have enough statistical uh, statistical precision. And in fact, they say in the footnotes regarding this result, the one that I say is paradoxical, that it's unlikely to come about because it's so unlikely that you would uh, have a sample size that would be large enough to give you such a small confidence interval. But uh, just briefly, let me say something about that. That just depends on how egregious your delta is. As I make delta further and further out, it's more and more likely that I could find a result that, that doesn't include delta. And it's more and more likely that I will be able to claim non-inferiority. But let me, let me finish before I get to some of the uh, these other nuances. I'm going to go ahead and erase the, I'll leave the inconclusive ones because they show that in, any time that your 95% confidence interval extends past delta, you have to claim that it's inconclusive because of the possibility of these values here. Now look what's interesting. Uh, in order to claim that something is non-inferior, it has to be statistically worse than the, uh, than the old treatment by a margin that exceeds delta entirely. In other words, the whole 95% confidence interval uh, of, the, of the result must fall all the way to the right of the pre-specified margin for non-inferiority, which in, the, in our journal club, the particular one was the, not the torch trial, but the flame trial, I believe. 15% uh, was considered the, the pre-specified margin for non-inferiority, which they marginally justified. But let, let me just point out a couple of things about this. First, first of all, this margin of delta, everything, every time the upper bound of the confidence interval falls anywhere to the side of this, any result that you get where the 95% confidence interval uh, excludes delta and falls to the left side of the chart, you get to claim either superiority or non-inferiority. So because this is a stochastic process involving randomness, it then it means then that statistically you are more likely to ultimately claim in superiority or non-inferiority just because you have more real estate available to you on the basis of this diagram for your stochastic or partly random results to fall in a zone that allows you to claim superiority or non-inferiority. So that that is a that is a huge huge problem. And the bigger your delta is, the more real estate, the further you move delta, the more you are reserving real estate for the results that you want. And so let me also show you, let me show you from another perspective what it means and why this whole statement seems to have an implicit assumption or a bias that believes that the new treatment is always going to be either the same or better as an existing treatment. So let's say we get a superior result and the confidence intervals all lie on this side, that's great. Well, let's push it over this way a little bit further. Okay, we can still claim non-inferiority. Push it over a little bit further. Well, we'll still claim non-inferiority. Push it even a little bit further. Now we're in dangerous territory because we're statistically worse than the, uh, the active comparator or the, the standard uh, historically uh, proven or thought to be proven treatment. Push it a little bit further. No, we're still going to claim non-inferior. It's only when we push it so that it barely crosses the, the delta margin, the pre-specified margin of non-inferiority, that we're willing to say, well, we don't even say now that we lost. We just say, oh, that was inconclusive. We just need to shrink that confidence interval back this way just a little bit, and we would have gotten away with it. 
the, the same with all the inconclusive results. It's only when it becomes ridiculous and the full 95% confidence interval gets pushed beyond our delta that we, uh, that we claim that, that the, the new therapy was uh, actually uh, in, inferior. So I, I think that this, this analysis of this uh, figure from the consort statement makes clear that, that there is a bias in the interpretation of these results that the new treatment is always going to be either non-inferior or superior to the standard treatment. And, and notice how many more of these results you can create by just pushing this pre-specified margin of non-inferiority a little further and a little further. Even this result, even the obviously inferior result, would have become a non-inclusive result if I just nudge the delta margin over a little bit so that it crosses the 95% confidence interval of that result. And some of my inconclusive results then also uh, start to count towards non-inferiority as I move that margin over further and further. And there's a lot of arbitrariness in, in this, and like we discussed in our delta inflation paper, there's really no standard for investigators choosing their delta. It's, it's rife for manipulation in, in, the, in the design of even superiority trials, but especially in the design of non-inferiority trials. So let me show you my final, my final uh, beef with this. Uh, with and why that I think the, the the other reason that I think it's highly biased. Now, for the sake of uh, clarity and reducing busyness, I am going to uh, erase some of those. If we have to be, if if we have to exclude all values uh, between hazard ratio of one and, and delta in order to claim it is inferior, I believe that we need to have a delta on the other side for symmetry and logical coherence of our interpretations. So if we did that and we had a delta margin over here, I would say, okay, I might be willing for you uh, to say that this is non-inferior, but I'm not willing for you to say that that, that that is superior. In order to be superior, if we required symmetry, you would have to have a 95% confidence interval that falls entirely outside of your uh, uh, pre-specified margin for non-inferiority, which would make it kind of a pre-specified margin for superiority, because it doesn't make sense to me that you could have a statistically significant result favoring the old therapy and that you would call it non-inferior and the only way that you would and you would still call it non-inferior the only way that you can call it inferior is if you fall all the way to that side of, of delta if that's the case then i think that for the sake of fairness you should likewise have to have your entire 95 percent confidence interval fall to the left of the mirror image of delta uh, on on this chart otherwise you would uh you have to claim non-inferiority for your result. And this would make it very difficult for these investigators who want to uh, have their cake and eat it too and get a free lunch and heads I win, tails you lose. This is, it's a no-brainer to do a non-inferiority trial because so much real estate is available in this uh, uh, graph for you to claim non-inferiority and then the claiming of superiority is very simple. You only need any 95% confidence interval that doesn't include a hazard ratio of one. Not so for non-inferiority. And as a final plea to your sense of logic and propriety, I would say that here is why this is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Because the fact that dabigatran uh, was preceded historically by Coumadin is, I believe, an arbitrary accident of nature. You can argue these things. It's a completely different agent. Somebody could have accidentally discovered it before the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation isolated Coumarins in the, in the rotten clover, or however the story goes. So if that were the case, we could then have a treatment that we claimed was superior on this side, because it, you know, it didn't include a confidence interval of uh, zero, and let's say it was, let's say it's 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, 0.9,
is the point estimate of this one. Okay, and so that's if the bigotran uh, is is uh, better. But if if it happened that the bigotran were the competitor, and Coumadin was new to market, then this 0.9 would become a 1.10 right here. And now the confidence interval would extend uh, across uh, this margin here, and we would not be able to claim inferiority. We would claim an inconclusive result. And it doesn't make any sense to me that the arbitrary distinction of comparator versus active, favored, or quote, new, that's why new is in quotes, new therapy, uh, that the conclusion would reverse if you reverse the designation uh, of, of the drug uh, in, 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 the, in the trial. And so my proposal here would prevent such reversals from happening by shaking up this consort uh, figure to make it more logical, symmetrical, uh, and rational. And so I thank you for joining me for this podcast. You can find me on Twitter at MedEvidenceBlog or at MedicalEvidenceBlog.com. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to entertain your comments uh, on Twitter and on the blog. Thank you.